So uh, the first question is, how did you become interested in gerontology? Um, well, I actually grew up in a very small town in western Nebraska, a very large family. And I adored my maternal grandmother, who guarded her independence and was fiercely independent until uh, she actually uh, broke a hip and ended up not being able to spend the last year or so of her life um, totally independent. But I always respected that and the fact that my family was able to always rally around and when she did have a, an issue, they managed to help her to sustain herself. And so that, I guess that was the beginning. Um, but in terms of you know, my career, I actually spent a, a significant number of years uh, working in hospitals. And, um, and while I was the director of social work at Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions, I acquired an, an MBA and then moved into hospital administration. But during the years that I worked in hospitals, it be, I became very aware very early that so many older adults, particularly those more vulnerable over older adults without good resources, don't have the option of living like my, my grandmother did. And so, I really began to try to look at alternative ways um, to help people as they transition out of hospitals, not have to be uh, placed in nursing homes and going back to the community. And early on I did a little research in that regard funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that um, we eventually published where we actually ended up being able to place um, these were primarily black, uh, uh, African, you know, Af African American uh, people who ended up being placed in foster care programs, and it ultimately got funded by the the Maryland State Medicaid program. So that was sort of the beginning. But then I moved away from from hospital administration, and I actually had the opportunity then to. Uh, go to work at the New York Academy of Medicine, which essentially is a think tank, a research uh, initiative. I started there as a senior VP for finance administration, so I wasn't doing um, any programs work. But in the mid-90s, I really got interested again in the fact that in the intervening years, nothing had changed. Mm -hmm. And so, I partnered with a colleague of mine to look at what schools of social work were doing in um, creating the workforce to work with older adults and then um, how they were doing that. And I found through a series, we did a, a little a qualitative research project where we ultimately found out that not much was being done. So I over the years then designed a program, the first program I designed, which is called the Hartford Partnership for, uh, now I can't even, let's see, the Hartford Partnership for Aging Education. Anyway, uh, and I fortunately got it funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation, where we actually uh, brought the community people who were providing services to older adults to the table to design the educational experience for students as a way of trying to recruit them into the field. And that started anyway in 1999, and we were very successful, but I then learned that students weren't interested in working with older adults. And so we came face to face with the reality that the ageism that pervades our society actually has an influence on um, discouraging uh, people in social work and nursing and medicine and in all the fields of practice where, where that are needed actually uh, to work with older adults. Um, they weren't just, they weren't at the table and they weren't moving forward. So we were, we were very successful in 
moving that program along and it, it, um, it actually helped recommit me to focus the work in the remainder of the years I was going to work um, really on supporting uh, what I called uh, making sure to support older adults to live independently um, as they age and do that in a very healthy and useful way. So, uh, well, it does happen, and it's the right place at the right time. Yeah. You know, the, the, this, this model we designed wasn't really a new idea, but it's, it was the idea whose time had come. And I think now, that program is actually now transitioning to CSWE for sustainability. So I, I count that as a, a huge major, ma a, you know, measure of success. Um, and we and it's being implemented also in in the VA hospitals in their 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 uh, geriatric research education and clinical centers mm -hmm. and partnering also with those local schools of social work. So we've managed to move the project into um, more than a half of the graduate schools of social work at this point. Um, with the goal, of course, of continuing to create the workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's been a wonderful journey, and we've done a couple of other initiatives also in moving it along. Yeah. So, so it's been very exciting. You're like a pioneer. <laughs> well, uh, I guess you could say that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm a newer pioneer on the heels of really very substantial pioneers who preceded me and who are now working with me side by side. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you kind of already answered question number two. <laughs> Describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. Um, so at what point in your career did you embrace gerontologists? I actually haven't ever thought of myself in terms of being a gerontologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, to me it's a label, and it's not a bad label, but I, I, um, I just think of myself as someone who has great respect for older adults and who really, um, you know, not only want to find ways to change our attitude about what it's like to grow old, but to really respect the potential contributions that older adults can make in a variety of ways. Um, but once I started this, this HAPPY program, um, I then began to realize that you can't, let's say, move education along to the reality of training people for current practice without looking at the other components of the educational system. So I also was able to, to co-develop a, a um, leadership academy in aging for deans and directors of schools of social work. And we partnered or I partnered with the National Association of Deans and Directors, and particularly working with a woman who's the almost retiring dean at Albany, Catherine Breyer Lawson. And she and I have had this program. This is the seventh year, and by now we have had almost more than 70 deans and directors or directors come through this program with two goals. One is, of course, for them to take a serious look at their own leadership uh, style and abilities and actually to work to strengthen them. And the second is to direct their schools to strengthen their programs in aging. Um, and they all have to develop a project to implement as you know, over the course of a year. So that's really been, you know, another component. And, you know, frankly, an underlying desire I have is really 
to elevate the value of the field education experience in the social work education uh, where it should be. And I think probably it doesn't still get the value it deserves or get the recognition it deserves. But that's been, uh, you know, an underlying goal. And as we moved through this process of essentially supporting the development of a workforce to work with older adults, we then turned our eyes really to the challenges of practice. And individuals who work with older adults don't have the same uh, possibility for compensation that social workers who work in other fields do. Mm -hmm. Technically the pay is lower and there isn't a lot of recognition for um, you know either direct reimbursement you know or to be recognized for the financial contribution social workers make to their environment. So we we moved then in the direction of trying to create a database of evidence for the, for the value or the contributions of social work. Um, and we actually created an evidence-based database that we were able to keep current for through 2010 with funding from Atlantic Philanthropies because we learned, not surprisingly, that you can't go to policymakers to educate or even advocate if you really don't have data. Um, and so we, uh, and that's an ongoing issue, um, but it's fundamental to being able to raise the standard for people, social workers who really do want to work with older adults. So uh, it's, uh, and then the other program that, that I have co-founded is the National Care Coordination Coalition. And when you talk to Robin Golden tomorrow, she is the, uh, the co-founder with me and it's still going. And what we've developed over the years focused really on older adults who represent the highest uh, utilizers of healthcare delivery services and are the highest cost to, to the healthcare delivery system. Um, that a, key, a fundamental missing ingredient in the care delivery and the recovery, not, and of course, you know, improving the quality of care for older adults, particularly as they transition and are maintained in the community or helped in the community but also to demonstrate the financial contribution that can be made. And so we began to focus our attention right before, right as healthcare reform was being discussed on Capitol Hill. And we formed this, co this organization called the National Care Coordination Coalition, or N3C. And this is an entity that uh, is very broad. We have 69 participating organizations and members. And it's, you know, a very interdisciplinary, interprofessional group of people in many organizations. And we looked at the evidence that exists in support of comprehensive care coordination whose outcomes not only improve quality, but frankly for policymakers most importantly. Um, have a positive impact on the bottom line of care. And um, we took that evidence to Capitol Hill to, to educate policymakers as health care reform was discussed. And we take a, a little bit of credit for the fact that care coordination is frequently mentioned as important in the Affordable Care Act. And of course, is um, you know now the challenge is the implementation and what's really happening and how do you make sure that that you link health and medicine with long-term and social supports 
in a very productive manner as um, integrated systems are being promoted. Um, and we're actually having a half-day symposium tomorrow where we're moving forward with looking at now that we've now that th these delivery systems have been in, put in place, and now that integrated care delivery is a big focus of care, and that these delivery systems require um, that organizations not only ha are ha are at risk for effective and cost-effective delivery of care, but that they're also responsible for populations of people who, through the transition, let's say out of the hospital into the community and linking to the community services in an effective way. And what, what we did last year was have a half-day symposium focused on helping community entities build the business case for partnering with hospitals in a way that would minimize healthcare systems from going and recreating their own. And we just released a brief from that entity last month. But the program tomorrow is focused on the fact that now, there are many separate companies who are, that are being formed and selling themselves to healthcare delivery systems as the alternative that they then can provide that coordination and that referral system and in some ways even the services themselves. And we're going to take a look at that and from, try to from an objective point of view, but in terms of what is it, is it value-based, is it, and where does that leave um, community entities like the AAAs, um, who are clearly at risk, um, and what does that mean ultimately then for older adults? Um, so, so far it's been a pretty good journey. So how, how did you move from like administration to social work? Well, you know, I started social work. And then I moved into administration. Okay. And then I did, and, and then I moved from administration to a broader finance role. Mm -hmm. And then after I had been at the New York Academy of Medicine for several years, um, I was, si I was sitting at a table, one of our little conference tables, with three physicians. And they were all prominent physicians who had the ability, any place, not only in the US, but to some extent in the world, for being able to pick up a phone and call anybody. You know, and in some cases, there was one physician there who could, could call the president. But these were very highly respected people, but certainly understood the, the healthcare delivery system and understood, uh, and they could, they could influence. So what were we talking about? We were talking about how even they, in their personal lives, cannot interface personally with the delivery system in an effective way. And that was the moment that I re-entered um, the, you know, the area of real practice and delivery care. And that's when I started looking. And, and it was their suggestion, I must say, that the way to approach this is be for, through social work. Because from their point of view and their experience as physicians, social work had the, the, the knowledge and the skill and certainly the value base to be able to uh, strengthen and change 
uh, if you will, I guess, try to bring together the disparate parts of care on behalf of older adults and, and to advocate in an effective way. And so that's how I re-entered uh, a focus um, on, on social work and, and actually on program development and on working with older adults. After I did this first little project that I mentioned, it coincided with the fact that the Johnny Hartford Foundation was just becoming interested in the profession of social work. And I don't know if you know about that, the Hartford Foundation. They are the largest foundation in the U.S. that focuses on their funding only on older adult issues. And they've been predominantly focused on education, first physicians, then nurses, and, now, and then social workers. So they, I fortunately, they approached me and suggested that this model that I developed with my colleague might be brought to scale on behalf of older adults. And so for, well, it's soon the 16th year, we gradually did, a, did pilots and we modified and refined the program. And then we uh, decided we would do a systematic spread. And so we then uh, incorporated uh, other schools of social work and have done orientation and training. And um, we actually, for a very long time, had a student initiative uh, where students' voices were heard and they were able to connect with each other. Um, and unfortunately, I think as it moves to CSWE, they're not going to continue that component. Um, but to some extent, that relates to their own mission, which is a little different. But so Nat, so the so the Hartford Foundation really created the impetus, and my program was just one of four to be funded. And if you've talked to some of the other colleagues, you know there's been a faculty scholars program that was Barbara Berkman's program, and there's been a doctoral fellows program, and then there's been. Uh, the, the CSWE Jarrow Ed Center program, which is Nancy Hoyman. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're interviewing her, but she's here. <laughs> anyway, so, um, you know, it's, so, and that's where I've landed, and I gradually made the decision that I couldn't have two full-time jobs. So I had begun to move away from my uh, administrative job. And then I unfortunately had an accident. And uh, when I, so, I, and I had the experience, I guess it re, it re-energized me. Because having spent over five months in a hospital um, and having to really fight with the system of care, um, in order to, you know, get really good coordination, and which we did do thanks to the strong advocacy of my husband and each of our knowledge of how healthcare delivery doesn't work and how you have to piece it together. Um, and the other reality is I am an older adult, and so the expectation of my recovery and rehabilitation was not um, not high, uh, so it it re-energized me to realize that. And actually, I mean, six years later, I'm still, you know, trying to figure out how to best do it. But the fact is that it's up to people like me, well, and young people like you to take on the mission of helping people understand, you know, what really is possible and what's doable. Mm -hmm. um, and, 
you know, how to move beyond that, I, I don't know. I have a fair amount of hope that, uh, that you and your colleagues are the future that will really help to move to change that system. And that, and that perception, it's, uh, well, you'll be helped by the, the numbers of people, you know. 10,000 people a day turn 65. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. And there aren't that many babies born every day. So the future is ours if we take it and embrace it. Um, but for me, the transition so far has been worth it. And there are wonderful colleagues who are also committed, um, who need to be energized. So what, what primarily are you doing now? Um, I, I transitioned away from the New York Academy of Medicine. I was recruited to the uh, Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College at the City University of New York a very long time. But the goal there, the dean recruited me to establish um, a very comprehensive care coordination initiative that, was, that is interdisciplinary and that, that uh, has uh, the, the uh, goal, two goals, one is to strengthen care coordination as a component of interprofessional education and to um, build collaborations with the community to develop active uh, engagement of new models and researching new models of care that will have a positive impact on supporting the transition of people and older adults who actually have chronic conditions, and in many cases, multiple chronic conditions, but to help them transition into a very useful and productive life. Um, so I've been there a year and a half, and academia is quite different than uh, practice or, um, you, know, po you know, policy and, um, and uh, program development. But it's worth it. I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been successful in creating one program initiative with the School of Public Health and the School of Nursing and us. And then we've, we're working with the School of Nursing also um, on an educational initiative. The first one is actually a, a research initiative to introduce an additional dimension um, into the care coordination program for individuals who are uh, part of the, the New York State Health Home programs who have at least one chronic condition and, and a serious mental illness, have to be over 50 years of age. So. We're introducing, I don't know if you are familiar with the CDSMP. It's a, it's a very well developed and researched um, self-management program that, in, that in originated out of San Francisco. And so we are going to introduce that into the, the care coordination program that already exists at this a federally qualified health clinic with the goal of successful discharge with increased self-management skills as a component of uh, care coordination. But it's interprofessional and um, it's focused on ultimately on prevention. So um, academia is a slower process than um, than program development and and uh, research. How is that for you? Well, it's uh, 
you're not gonna it's it's not easy it's not how's that it's not easy it's not easy uh it's it's not, well I, you know i think there are a couple of things one is having spent 20 years in one organization that's quite different very different mission you know very different work structure standard and move into a totally new environment with a totally different mission and a different pace, that uh, in and of itself would create a challenge. Um, but, and to be, to have someone like me who's not the most patient person in the world, um, try to navigate in a system that's very siloed, uh, and I'm not entirely used to, I'm, I'm more used to an environment where collaboration is easy. Uh, but listen, we've got two things moving, so it's a start. It's a start. So, um, did you have female mentors who impacted your amazing teacher anthology? Um, I would say there are, I certainly had mentors who were, who were very important to me in, stay, in, in healthcare delivery and, and in focusing on facilitating independence. Um, and I would, and one of the, one, that was a significant woman who was instrumental in my interest in staying and in, in working with older adults was Rose Dobroff, um, who um, actually started the Brookdale Center on Aging in New York, among other things. Um, it's not, I mean, she's older and, and retired now. Um, but I would say there are colleagues that I'm, st I'm currently working with who have influenced me. And the most, I, I think the most important influence that has kept me going and energized are the faculty and students that I've come to know and work with as a result of the implementation of my the, the Hartford Partnership Program for Aging Education mm -hmm. and the enthusiasm and commitment that, that the faculty and the field directors and the community agencies who are now at the table of education for the first time in a long time and the students then who are the recipients, that's what has really been most important to me. I mean, as, you know, just a small example, a few years ago, we went to DC, we went to Albany to talk to a senator about the importance of care coordination and the role of social work and trying to facilitate a standardization of care, hopefully meaning to pay. And the staff person was a social work graduate from the Happy Program at Albany. And then in January, we went to meet with Kathy Greenlee you know, the, the head of the administration for community living. And she had a staff person there with her who just graduated from the University of Chicago in the HAPPY program. So that's better than having, you know, mentors in the traditional sense of the word. It's, it's really sort of understanding and learning from something that you had helped starting with and seeing it grow. Mm -hmm. that, that really is an incredible experience and to have it grow and grow. Mm -hmm. You're still proud. I am, uh, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud. Uh, I've done, I've, I've helped do something that I think is very important. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people have really made it happen, which is why, so why it's success. Nobody does anything on their own if it's really going to work well. So 
what is unique about being a woman gerontologist? I guess I would say women women are really the, the, the people who have responsibility for older adults. Women are much more aware of the physiology of change of their bodies as they age. Um, women have greater sensitivity to um, Yeah, I think recognizing the value of people as they age who don't usually minimize their potential impact. I'm not saying all women are like that, but, um, and I think honestly, for better or for worse, by and large, my colleagues here, uh, to the contrary, my male colleagues, but would lead the charge in terms of at least making sure that as we age, we have the best possible opportunities. Um, and what, what women don't have, of course, is the loudest voice in the process. Uh, so, but I think that's a major contribution. I mean, you know, you can think of many other things. Who provides all the care? Um, right? uh, who, uh, you know, I, well, I've said enough. It's, uh, it is where it is. And I guess it, because it's that way, the voice to change attitudes isn't as strong as if it were our, our male companions. Um, so how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? Well, I think I kind of described that. Uh, but, yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm very aware. I mean, I'm, uh, shall I admit, I mean, I'm 72 years old and um, I acquired this disability when I was 67. So it was unusual for someone, if you say my age, to be on a spinal cord injury unit. Uh, you know, I mean, they're most, but, um, you know, with good support, I've been able to keep moving along, but it uh, makes me, I mean, I realize, I think more than anything else, just how vulnerable you know, I am and how vulnerable older adults feel when some thing happens or when they know they're at risk, you know, then what's going to happen? Yeah. You know, you know that, and you know that, the, the, you absolutely know the resources aren't there. Um, family units are called to be involved. Um, you know, for me at least, fortunately, I have a very uh, dedicated and committed husband who makes a lot of things possible for me, including travel, <laughs> going to meetings and staying at work. It takes a lot yeah. to um, get me up, get me going. Uh, so I'm very well aware that the, as you age, there, there are fewer and fewer things you can do totally alone. Mm -hmm. So kind of you kind of get more aware of the challenges then? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And very much more aware of how hard it is to penetrate a system of care that has um, been put in place you know, for decades with increasing focus on the bottom line and increasing focus on standards of what has to be done every day mm. without any time in there to really be aware of the individual that you're interacting with and how that might, 
you know, make it easier in many ways to have satisfactory care. It's, um, I think I realize it was, it's, it's a struggle that even with the push of the Affordable Care Act, there's a long way to go. Yeah. More problem focused Very much more. And you, you, everybody has to have an advocate, and I think it's those of us who interact with the system that ultimately have to come together to change it. So um, the Wiggle pro Project focuses on the legacies of older women gynecologists. Within that framework, work, is there anything else you would like us to know? Keep going. Try to find ways to um, publicize you know, the results of what you've done, and to highlight the uh, contributions of some of the women that you're going to, you have and will be talking to. There are real stars here, really committed people. Um, and I know that you're interviewing them, and they're also very passionate about what they do. Um, and that's really, that, that message, that voice has to get out there. Um, to, and to encourage, you know, women have so many more choices today than they did certainly when I was choosing what to do. So being sure to find ways to encourage women to move into the field, very important. And by the way, that will require attention to the economics of going into the field. You know, everyone has to live. That means everyone has to have a source of income. Mm -hmm. um, so there has to be a real incentive to do it, not just the compassion to make a contribution. A lot of attention should be paid to that. Mm -hmm.